fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Wait until they finish. 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 Wait until they Uh, Dr. Rose Caldwell, uh, Dr. Partley, Dr. Fulton, and uh, Dr. Taufik, and uh, our leader, Dr. Uh, Lou, and uh, also the program director, Dr. Mark Henry. So really, without their effort and their time and sincerity, uh, this is, uh, would not happen easily. So, of course, and the support of Dr. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> No matter what, you we like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Khalid uh, uh, actually, uh, like, he graduated from medical school in Egypt in uh, 2007, and for who don't know uh, the system there, medical school is seven years, three years basic science, three years in the hospital, clinical, and one year internal internship. So, He graduated from medical school before recruited in the School of Medicine as administrator of anatomy, and he had master in anatomical sciences. Before coming uh, to uh, Medical College of Georgia, he got one of the competitive scholarship, which is full scholarship, sponsored by Egyptian government. Khaled spent last several years working hard, and uh, this is, was like uh, obvious from his accomplishment. He published seven, he contributed to seven publications, two of them as first author, and five as full authors. And he has one in preparation right now as first author. Also, he awarded several awards, among these awards, two awards from Vision Discovery Institute, uh, Excellence in Research during the Graduate Research Day, 2016 and 2018. Also, uh, I'm sure some of us attended the three many thesis. He did a wonderful job. He did a great job. And he, he said, when after uh, the award the ceremony, I told him, don't get sad or upset. He did good. He said, okay, it's enough for me that people voted for me. I have the love of people. Mm -hmm. So actually he did a great job and he got the first award based on the audience for vote. Also, he presented his uh, work in several meetings, including the ARVO, and he's going the next week to ARVO. He has oral presentation. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Al-Masri, and I wish him the best of luck. Thank you, Dr. Shabal, for a uh, nice presentation, and thank you all for attending uh, my defense today. Uh, so uh, now we are concluding four years of work, so I'm hoping that uh, this moment will be uh, a good one. <laughs> so uh, so uh, our, my project is a uh, mechanism of 12-15 lipoxygenase uh, induced retinal microvascular dysfunction in diabetic retinopathy. So it's a blessing to uh, be able to see the world around us and the beautiful images that you can see. This is a blessing that uh, some people uh, were deprived from it. But imagine if these spots like this start to appear in front of your eyes and these spots go together till completely the vision is lost. This is what a patient of diabetic hypnopathy uh, suffers from or experience. For every 10 uh, people having diabetes above 40, uh, three of, uh, of those patients will develop diabetic retinopathy uh, by a percent of 30%. Uh, type 2 diabetes, the uh, patients of type 2 diabetes, 60% of them will develop diabetic retinopathy. What, uh, while unfortunately, patients with type 1 diabetes, 100% they will develop the diabetic retinopathy complication. And uh, as we can see uh, that this, this is a social problem, NIH reported the doubling of the number of uh, diabetic retinopathy patients between 2000 and 2010 
moving from 4 million patients up to more than 7 million patients. But even NEI expecting that this number would be doubled again, reaching more than 14 million patients of diabetic retinopathy. And the only available treatments right now are invasive therapies like laser photocoagulation or intravitreal injections of uh, drugs, and we will go through these. Those are invasive therapies, so this raises the importance of finding out new early targets for therapy to avoid these invasive uh, uh, procedures. But to find out new targets, we need first to understand what is the retina. The retina is the light sensitive part at the back of the eye which receives the light forms the image and send it to the brain simply it's like the camera the eye is like the camera and the retina is like the film at the back of the camera which capture the light transferring the light signals into nerve impulse signal transfer it through the uh, optic nerve to the brain so this it's very important to uh, have the concept that the retina is a neurovascular unit with multiple neuronal tissue and vascular tissue, all of these cells are interacting with each other. So the, uh, this concept is very important and we can see from this diagram that the retina is formed of multiple retinal neurons at, arranged at different layers, glial cells and vascular cells. So this complexity uh, of neuronal tissue is supplied by double blood supply. The retina has dual blood supply. Uh, an inner retinal blood supply through the retinal circulation and central retinal artery and outer retinal blood supply through the choroid. This raises two, uh, makes two barriers, two retinal blood barriers, inner blood retinal barrier and outer retinal blood barrier. The, the uh, barrier which is affected in our disease model, which is diabetic retinopathy, the inner blood retinal barrier is affected in diabetic retinopathy, leading to leakage of fluids from blood into the back of the eye, causing macular edema, which is the main cause of vision loss in the diabetic retinopathy patients. So diabetic retinopathy, as I just mentioned, the retina is a neurovascular unit. Diabetic retinopathy is a neurovascular disease, leading, which is the leading cause uh, of blindness in the working age group uh, with cardinal signs including microaneurysms, leukostasis, and this is an early sign of inflammation in the retina, macular edema, capillary degeneration, and new vascularization. The capillary degeneration causes ischemia, and ischemia induces new blood vessels formation. Those new blood vessels are weak and leaky, so they allow the passage of fluids into the back of the eye, causing the macular edema. And these leaky vessels also are weak and liable for rupture, may cause hemorrhage, which will cause these blind spots, these spots in the visual field of the diabetic retinopathy patients. The diabetic retinopathy, uh, based on the formation or non-formation of blood vessels, is divided into two types, non proliferative diabetic retinopathy before the formation or the new vascularization, before the formation of the new blood vessels. After the new vascularization is called proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which is, may, uh, may be associated with even vitreous hemorrhage, which, raise, uh, which is the rationale for one of the uh, invasive uh, therapies, which is called vitrectomy, complete <coughs> removal of the vitreous of those patients to make them able to see. So uh, again, this uh, put in mind that those available therapies are invasive with complications like what, which uh, can be complicated. These therapies like infection uh, and the patient will be in need for repeated injections of these drugs. So again, this is uh, the rationale for our work, which is finding out new early targets. So Dr. Shabrawi in a study published in Diabetes in 2011, identified an activation of the enzyme 215 oxygenase and its incre increase of its bioactive liver products um, in the vitreous of proliferative diabetic retinopathy patients. And this, this enzyme is responsible for generation of bioactive lipids. This, there is a growing body of evidence highlighting the importance of those bioactive lipids in vascular, retinal vascular injury. The previous publication, the previous work from our lab identified in vitro studies using human retina enthusiasts by Dr. Ibrahim identified upregulation of 15 heat in the media of human retina enthusiasts treated with high glucose as a model for, for hyperglycemia in diabetes. Uh, and the 15 heat was significantly upregulated. This is in vitro studies. 
while in vivo studies using wild type animals injected into their eyes with the 12 heat, which is the main bioactive lipid product of the enzyme in rodents, it increased the permeability of the retinal vessels, which was confirmed by uh, the albumin leakage in the retina of those animals receiving the intravitreal injection of the heat, which is the product of the enzyme 1215 lipoxygenase. So, uh, what are lipoxygenases? These are family of non-heme iron-containing enzymes uh, catalyze the dioxygenation of polyunsaturated fatty acids into bioactive lipid products which have enormous role as signaling molecules implicated in wide variety of canonical pathways. These, as you can see, th this, these enzymes are widely distributed throughout the animal and plant kingdom. Uh, these lipoxygenases work through oxidation of the polyunsaturated fatty acids. There are different types of lipoxygenases depending uh, on which carbon atom in the fatty acid backbone that will be uh, receiving the oxygen. The enzyme will give the oxygen to which carbon atom. So there are different types of lipoxygenases depending on this. There is 15 lipoxygenase, 12 and 15 uh, lipooxygenase enzyme. Uh, so, um, and here you can see the 3D structure of the mammalian 15 lipoxygenase with internal uh, domain and catalytic domain with the non-heme iron with the, uh, also the binding site for the substrate which is the uh, hydrophobic uh, pocket in which the, the substrate slides with the methyl head, uh, with the methyl in the head uh, in the binding site. So the lipoxygenase pathway <coughs> Simply, the uh, stratified lipids in the membrane by the action of phospholipase E2, polyunsaturated fatty acids will be liberated from the membrane lipids like linoleic acid, arachidonic acid, DHA, and EPA. Those polyunsaturated fatty acids are available substrates for a number of enzymes like cyclooxygenase, liboxygenase, cytochrome B450. So our interest is in liboxygenase. There are two main types, 5-liboxygenase and 12-15-liboxygenase. And uh, especially when, when the arachidonic acid is a substrate, 5 lipoxygenase produces leukotrienes, and 1215 produces the 12 heat and 15 heat, which is hydroxy tetranoic acid. So these hydroxy tetranoic acids are implicated in a wide variety of diseases, as we can see uh, reported by our lab, that they are involved in retinal neovascularization as well. So a uh, previous um, uh, work from our lab demonstrated that NADPH oxidase is, is one of the main sources of reactive, reactive oxygen species in diabetics retina. As we can see from these in vitro studies using retinal interferon cells, the uh, measurement of reactive oxygen species after heat treatment was upregulated uh, both uh, in, in vitro and also the NADPH oxidase NOx2 was upregulated with the heat treatment in retinal interferon cells. Uh, this was in vitro. Regarding the in vivo studies, in diabetes, reactive oxygen species were, were upregulated in diabetic retina, but when uh, pecalin, is, which is an inhibitor for the enzyme, was used, uh, the reactive oxygen species were significantly reduced, and NOx2 expression was significantly reduced under uh, in diabetic retina when pecalin was uh, used. Another uh, uh, topic that we are going to uh, uh, talk today about and this is one of the main, uh, this is basically the core of my work, is ER stress or endoplasmic reticulum stress. So the endoplasmic reticulum stress is a similar uh, process which aims uh, initially uh, to solve uh, uh, the problem of accumulation of misfolded proteins within the, uh, within the cell. So as you can see, there are three transmembrane proteins located in the membrane of the ER endoplasmic reticulum. These are called ER stress sensors. They are in, in conjunction with a, a protein called BIP. This BIP is actually a molecular chaperone. These chaperones are responsible for the proper folding of proteins. But when, up, uh, when unfolded or misfolded proteins accumulated within the, within the cell, these misfolded proteins compete with, uh, with uh, the ER stress sensors for the binding with BIP. So BIP will be translocated or leave these sensors free and go to try to solve the problem of uh, unfolded proteins. So once they are free, they start signaling molecules, uh, they start signaling pathways, ATF6 go to the Golgi where it is cleaved, and the cleaved ATF6 is a transcription factor, will be translocated to the nucleus. PERC is phosphorylated, and phosphorylated PERC phosphorylates EIF2-alpha, which is eukaryotic initiation factor 2-alpha, responsible for uh, 
implicated in the process of protein synthesis, but this phosphorylation is an inhibitory phosphorylation in a trial uh, that the cell is trying to inhibit the protein synthesis to decrease the load of proteins within the cell because there is a problem of uh, misfolded proteins. This is associated with active selective activation of another molecule, which is ATF4, it is uh, another transcription factor, which will, will be translocated to the nucleus as well. The third pathway is IRE1-alpha. This molecule has two domains, uh, an autotransphosphorylation domain, which is responsible for its autophosphorylation, and also an endoribonuclease domain. This endoribonuclease domain uh, cleaves 26 base introns from a specific mRNA for XPP1, uh, leading to frame shift uh, translation and uh, synthesis of another protein called spliced XBB1, which is the third transcription factor. All these transcription factors go to the nucleus in a trial to solve the problem of accumulation of misfolded proteins, upregulating what's called UPR, unfolded protein response genes. These genes will be trans uh, translated into proteins, into molecular chaperones, trying to solve the problem of misfolded proteins. If this uh, uh, succeeds, that's it. If not, there, there is another wave of, um, of uh, uh, events, including what's called ERAD, ER associated degradation. So these misfolded proteins would be degraded, degraded if this is uh, succeed to solve the problem, that's it. If not, there is another molecule is involved in induction of ER cis induced apoptosis. Uh, which is called CHOP. So this is in brief uh, uh, the uh, process of ER stress. Our work was, uh, uh, we are really appreciating the work of others, so these early studies demonstrating the role of the ER stress in 12-15 uh, live oxygen is signaling uh, the mechanism of ER stress induced vascular endothelial function and the work done by uh, Zhang's lab uh, in illustrating the role of ER stress in diabetic retinopathy. So these uh, area studies was, were very important to us in our uh, um, work. So uh, moving to the hypothesis and aims. My hypothesis was that hyperglycemia increased activity of the 1215 lipoxygenase enzyme, increasing the bioactive lipid products which activates NAPH oxidase, uh, leading to retinal microvascular dysfunction, and we were expecting that ER cysts will be activated. Uh, this hypothesis, we have two aims. The first aim was if uh, lipoxygenase inducing ER cysts as well in the diabetic retinas. The second aim was if the ER cysts activated, if there is any interaction with the activated NADPH oxidase. So uh, for the aim one, I can move it in, instead of the aim into a question. So this question was, does 12-15 lipoxygenase activate ER cysts in retina during diabetes or not? To answer this question, we started, uh, we made uh, the uh, animals diabetic using STZ injection uh, for, uh, we, we made those mice diabetic for three months, 12 to 14 weeks. After induction of diabetes, we isolated the retina, did the BCR, and as previously published or the work of others, ER cysts was upregulated in diabetes in wild type mice. What's, what was interesting to us that the live oxygenase knockout mice, we made them diabetic as well for three months. So in presence or in absence of diabetes, ER stress markers were significantly reduced in the retinas of live oxygenase knockout mice. So this was very important. We tried to uh, confirm these results by testing the direct effect of an, uh, the 12 heat, which is... Uh, the main, lipid, uh, the main lipid product of the enzyme in rodents. So we injected those mice intravitrally with a 12 heat. One week after the injection, we sacrificed the animal and we did BCR and we could identify upregulation of ER stress markers in the retinas of those mice after the intravitreal injection of 12 heat. This was at the RNA level. We also did this at the protein level and we could detect activation of markers of ER stress, especially the PER pathway uh, and uh, PDI was upregulated, protein disulfide isomerase in the retinas of those mice receiving the intravitreal injection of 12 heat. So these in vivo studies encourage us to extend our work into the in vitro studies using human retinal endothelial cells. 
So this human retina in the field says we treated them with a 15 heat. Now we used for the in vivo studies using in the, into the mice, we used 12 heat, which is the main product of the enzyme in rodents. But be, regarding the in vitro, we are using human cells, and the main active product of the enzyme in humans is 15 lipoxygenase. So this was the rationale for the use of 15 lipoxygenase in in uh, the human individual experiments. So we started with a time course and we could uh, detect activation of ER stress indicated by a PDI upregulation starting four hours after treating the cells with uh, 15 heat extending and extending up to 24 hours. This was a rationale for subsequent experiments and time point. We, we picked the four hours time point, but for the ER, for the BCR, we did the BCR after three hours and we could detect activation of CHOP after three hours. But we, luckily, we uh, had at the protein level activation of more markers of ER stress as indicated by upregulation of the PER pathway again and ATF6 this time. So the in vitro studies and in vivo studies give us a hint that uh, live oxygenase can induce ER stress. So the next step is to have a functional assessment. So we used an early um, a functional point, which is leukocyte adhesion to the human retina in the field cells. So we use this assay in the field leukocyte adhesion assay. Briefly, endothelial uh, human retina in the field cells will be activated by different kinds of treatments for 24 hours, and uh, leukocytes will be labeled to make them fluorescently labeled. Then uh, we will add the fluorescent labeled leukocytes to the activated endothelium for about 90 minutes. This is followed by washing of the excess non-adherent fluorescently labeled leukocytes. Then we will take these adherent leukocytes to the endothelium and do the quantification under inverted uh, fluorescence microscopy. The quantification of this experiment revealed that the positive control were uh, upregulated endothelial cells, uh, leukocytes were adherent to the endothelial cells. We replicated what we previously did, that 15 heat increased the number of adherent leukocytes to endothelial cells. The new piece of data that heat, uh, that ER cells in inhibition using phenylbutyric acid significantly reduced 15 heat induced leukocyte adhesion to the endothelial cells. So ER stress, now we, we concluded that inhibition of 12-15 lipoxygenase induced ER stress attenuates leukocyte adhesion to human retinal endothelial cells. Till this point, we can suggest an answer for our question, uh, which was, uh, does 12-15 lipoxygenase induce ER stress? So, and the answer is that, yes, we can suggest that 12-15 lipoxygenase is able to activate ER stress in retina during diabetes. So again, going back to the uh, hypothesis and the first aim, well, now we are moving to the second aim, if there is any interaction between ER stress and NADPH oxidase. So uh, the question will be, is there any crosstalk between lipoxygenase induced NADPH oxidase activation and ER stress in retina during diabetes? And this made me recall the grant that my PI got, uh, and the, our second aim was expecting that by inhibition of NADPH oxidase, ER stress will be inhibited. So, uh, this is critical because it's been one year for this. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, according to the original hypothesis, the hyperglycemia activates the enzyme, increasing the lipids, activating NAPH oxidase, activating ER stress, leading to retinal microvascular dysfunction. So, we were expecting by inhibiting NAPH oxidase, ER stress will be down-regulated. So, starting by the in vitro studies, we did, uh, again using PDI as a marker, 15 heat was significant to increase the PTI and upregulate it as an ER stress marker. Inhibition of NAPH oxidase using ebucyanin did not downregulate ER stress. Then, intravitreal injection of 12 heat into NOX2 knockout mice. So the intravitreal injection of 12 heat, we isolated one week after the injection, isolated the retina, did the PCR, and again, ER stress is upregulated even more than the wild type. Then we did it at the protein level and we could detect activation of ER stress in NOx2 knockout mice as well. So this, we conclude from this that inhibition of NAPH oxidase did not affect 12-15 lipoxygenase induced ER stress in vitro and in vivo. And here's the beauty of science, you should not just be hard-minded with your hypothesis, you need, you need to think about it. So the hypothesis is not working, what should we do? So what we did, ER stress is upregulated, 
The hypothesis, as you can see, not BHX days, we inhibit not BHX days, ERs is still upregulated. Up so this makes us think that there is one of two possibilities. Either ER stress induced by uh, lipoxygenase is working independently from that BH oxidase, or the other possibility that ER stress may be upregulated from that BH oxidase, uh, sorry, upstream from that BH oxidase, not downstream. So to answer this question, we need to, instead of inhibiting that BH oxidase, we need to inhibit ER stress. And once we inhibit ER stress, we are expecting two of, one of two possibilities. If ER stress is independent and we inhibited ER stress, that BH oxidase will still not be affected by the inhibition of ER stress. But if ER stress is upstream from that BH oxidase, so if we inhibit ER stress, that BH oxidase should be affected. So we did this in human retina endothelial cells. And we, uh, at the protein level here, as you can see, we looked at two subunits of nab days, NOX2 and b 47 fox the catalytic and regulatory units, and heat uh, was able to increase nab days uh, subunits. And interestingly, inhibition of ER stress reduced NOX2-induced 15 heat upregulation. So inhibition of ER stress attenuates the expression of NADPH oxidase. Another important point was the activity of the enzyme. So we measured ROS generation, and we could replicate previous uh, uh, experiments that heat upregulates ROS generation in human retina endothelial cells. Interestingly, inhibition of both ER stress and NADPH oxidase significantly reduced heat-induced ROS generation. So we suggesting that inhibition of liboxygenase not only uh, liboxygenase induced ER stress not only reduced NADPH oxidase expression but also reduced NADPH oxidase activity. So for this question, we can suggest that yes, there is a crosstalk and we can fit ER stress upstream from NADPH oxidase in the pathway. So the next uh, step was to find out, trying to find out the mechanism. The lab previously reported that this pathway ends with, ends with activation or increased uh, phosphorylation of a receptor of VGF, VGFR2. So VGFR2 phosphorylation was upregulated in human retina endothelial cells under 15 heat treatment. Uh, and inhibition of NADPH oxidase reduced VGFR2 phosphorylation. So now we need to see if NADPH oxidase inhibition reduced VGFR2 phosphorylation, if ER cells inhibition will do the same. So to answer this question, we uh, starting first doing the ELISA to measure the VGF levels in human retina endothelial cells treated with heat. So in brief, the ELISA, we, uh, we used the uh, VGF kits for ELISA kits. We added the supernatants of human retina endothelial cells after treatment with vehicle or 15 heat. Then, so uh, these kits, uh, the antibodies is uh, in the wells. So the VGF will bind to these antibodies followed by washing. After washing, another kind of antibodies linked to the enzyme will be added. So if the EVGF bound to, uh, it's like a sandwich. So these are conjugate antibodies with the enzyme. Then the substrate is added, the enzyme works on it, and uh, make changes in color. The color will be detected through the plate reader. So this is simply the idea of um, ELISA. But after all, doing all this, VGF levels were not increased by 15 heat treatment in human retina endothelial cells. So we go to we did an immune precipitation for the VGF receptor two, and so human retina endothelial cells treated with heat five minutes after the treatment. We did we uh, analyzed the cells, isolated the cells, did the immune precipitation for VGF R two, followed by uh, immunoplotting using phosphotyrosine to detect phosphorylated v VGF R two. So 15 heat significantly increased phosphorylation which was, uh, we did this before, so are replicating our results. Inhibition of ibucyanin, inhibition of nab days using ibucyanin reduced phosphorylation of VGFR2. The new piece of data that inhibition of ER stress did the same and reduced phosphorylation of VGFR2 induced by 15 heat. So inhibition of ER stress was able to uh, attenuate 12-15 lipoxygenase induced VGFR2 phosphorylation, and this is consistent with our uh, hypothesis uh, or our uh, uh, mechanistic axis that ER stress is upstream from NADPH oxidase. So uh, moving to another mechanism, we are trying to find out another mechanism, but this time instead of finding a mechanism downstream, we will try to look upstream. 
So uh, what will be a suggested uh, mechanism for induction of ER stress by 12 heat? We thought about that. So one of the most important uh, causes of induction of ER stress is disturbance of the calcium homeostasis. So the question here was, if we uh, F15 heat, which is the product of live oxygenase, will be able to upregulate or increase intracellular calcium levels in human retina epithelial cells. To do this, we measured the calcium, real-time calcium imaging, with the great, with the great help from Dr. Megan Megalorin's lab. She uh, actually, I looked for this for about eight months, and she, she figured it out and told me, here's everything. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>